This is the 26th video supplement for CIS 351, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. This video discusses sequential circuits. As a quick reminder, the first circuits we saw this semester were combinatorial circuits. In a combinatorial circuit, the output depends only on the current inputs. Identical inputs will always produce identical outputs. Every time I put 13 into the is prime circuit, the answer will be true regardless of what other values may have been given as input at some point in the past. In contrast, sequential circuits can store data, typically by using the flip-flops presented in the previous video. The output of these circuits depends on both the current inputs and the data currently stored in the flip-flops. They're called sequential circuits because the output is determined by the sequence of inputs, not just the current input. And we can argue that the previous inputs determine the output because those previous inputs are what determine the data currently stored in the flip-flops. Many, but certainly not all, of the circuits we'll look at will follow this general pattern. There'll be a combinatorial circuit in the middle with one or more registers to the right. So for now, just think of a register as a collection of flip-flops. A single flip-flop can store one bit, whereas an n-bit register is just n flip-flops working in parallel to store n bits. We often think of an n-bit register as storing a single n-bit integer. This combinatorial circuit takes external inputs as usual, but it also takes as input the current state of each register. The combinatorial circuit's output provides an updated value for each register. It can also produce traditional external output, either directly from the combinatorial circuit itself or by outputting one or more values from the registers. In other words, a sequential circuit can, in many cases, be viewed simply as a combinatorial circuit where some of the inputs are coming from registers. So now let's use JLS to build a very simple sequential circuit. So let's build a circuit that just simply counts up. Okay, so we'll follow that general pattern of having a combinatorial circuit in the middle and some registers to the right. So since we just want to do some counting, I'm going to import a ripple carry adder here as that combinatorial circuit in the middle. And then I'll use a register at the right to store as state our current value. I'll just call that register current. I'll make it a negative triggered flip-flop. Since the clock will start at zero, then we'll consider the end of each cycle when the clock falls from one back down to zero. And we'll make that 16 bits to line up with the size of the adder. So the basic approach here will be to take the current value of the adder and make that our current state. And then during each cycle, update that, that current state by whatever our increment is. And we'll let that increment come from the outside. I'll just call that input A. And then our output can be whatever we've counted up so far. Again, a 16-bit output. And I'll also put a display on that so we can more easily watch what's going on. And finally, we need a clock. Now remember that clock period needs to be long enough to account for everything that happens during that period. So we know from project one that a ripple carry adder has a time of about 335. And then I can go to the change timing here to see that the delay on the flip-flop itself is about 50. So we need a clock period greater than or equal to 385. For convenience, I'll just make it 400. So I'll come up here to create a clock. We'll make the cycle time 400 with a one time of 200. So it's an even clock, half ones, half zeros. And now I'll add a signal generator to put a value on input A. We'll just make it a steady one. And now we can run the simulator. I'll set the step to a half a clock period. And so we can watch. So halfway through the first clock period, the register has its default value of zero. And then at the end of that first clock period, we can see that we're asking for that register to be updated to one. So when the clock falls from zero to one, we can see that the register locks in that value of one. And every two steps from there, it increases by one. So the output of this circuit is determined by the sequence of inputs. It's not the same every time it goes from one to two to three to four and so on. In fact, we can make this a little bit more interesting. 
where I can change the input over time. So maybe we'll set it to one for, let's say 1600. So for four clock cycles, and then we'll bump it up to five. So when we do that, we see that the output goes from one to two, three, four, as expected, but then the input changes to five. So now it's going to count nine, 14, 19, 24, and so on. And now we have a basic sequential circuit with the combinatorial logic in the middle, that signed adder, and a register off to the right that's, that's remembering the current state, the amount we've summed up thus far, and that value is then becoming an input to the adder, which is incorporated into the calculation and affects the next state. Now let me emphasize that with a sequential circuit, the timing of the clock is very important. That clock period needs to be long enough to allow all the combinatorial logic in the middle to complete, as well as a little bit extra for the flip-flop. So for this example, we set the clock to 400. Remember, accounting for the 335 for the adder, plus an extra 50 for the flip-flop to work. But let's see what happens if we goof that up. If I set my cycle time to only be 100, which is not long enough for the adder to finish its addition, and then I start stepping through, it gets off track in a real hurry. So let's look at a slightly more complex sequential circuit. So this time, instead of always incrementing the state, let's add some conditions to that. So we'll, we'll count the number of even numbers that go by. And so again, to follow that pattern, we'll put our combinatorial logic in the middle. I'll grab a circuit that will determine whether a, the input is even or not. We'll make that a 16-bit input. And then we're going to count the number of even inputs we see. And this time, I'm just going to use the, the boring built-in adder. The reason I didn't do that in the previous example is the built-in adder won't make any changes until the end of its propagation delay, whereas a real adder would have some transient values. I wanted to see those transient values to show you what happens when your clock gets messed up. Now that we've seen that, I'm going to go with a simpler approach here and just have that built-in adder. And then our state, again, will be a register that just keeps track of the number of evens that we've seen. So here we have our combinatorial logic in the middle and our state off to the side. And so our combinatorial circuit is going to react to both the external input as well as the current state. We'll take the number of evens we've seen, feed that back into the adder, and now this is even circuit will tell us whether the input's even or not by putting a one as output if it's even and a zero otherwise. So we can just feed that zero or one right into our adder. So it will either add one or it won't. Now, if I try to connect this wire directly, you'll see it'll complain that the bits don't match. This out is just a single bit and the adder is expecting a 16 bit input. So what I'm going to do is grab a bundler and I need 16 output bits. Now I'm going to use the group bits feature here because the only bit that I'm going to get is bit zero, that zero or one. And then the other 15 bits I'll let just default to zero. What this will effectively do is turn my single bit from the is even circuit into 16 bits for the adder. And then the result of that adder will get passed to the register and that count will be our output. And now we need a clock. Actually, before we set up the clock, we need to know how long to make it. The is even circuit doesn't take very long at all. The key piece here will be the adder, which takes time 480. So we need a 480 plus 50 for the register, which is 530. Is even is pretty fast. So we'll just bump that up to a total of 600 to cover everything being 300 on and 300 off. And lastly, we need a signal generator. So to have it do something interesting, we'll give it a bunch of different numbers, but just so we can predict the output a little more easily, I'm gonna go with a pretty boring pattern here. So I'll just go one, two, three, four, five, and so on. All right, I'll set my step to half a clock period. That's not something you have to do. It just tends to work well for me. And actually, I forgot. Let me, let me set an output here so we can watch what's going on. So the state starts out at zero. Our first input is a one. So we don't expect that counter to go up. 
the next input is a 2, which is even, then 3, which is not even, then 4, which is, 5 isn't, 6 is, and so on. And if we go through till completion, we should see that it counts four numbers, 2, 4, 6, and 8. All right, so let's do one last example. So one key thing about combinatorial circuits, especially when it comes to arithmetic, is that you build into them the size of numbers they can handle. If you build a 16-bit adder, you can only add numbers up to 2 to the 16. If you build a 32-bit adder, you can only add numbers up to 2 to the 32. And that's all the more that combinatorial circuit can do on its own. If you need to add bigger numbers, you need to build a bigger circuit or combine circuits together or whatnot. With a sequential circuit though, because it can take in a sequence of inputs, not just a single input, you can, for example, build an adder that will add as large of a number as you want. You just have to put in one bit per clock tick. You can't put the whole number in all at once. You have to put it in in chunks. So pause the video and think about how you can build a sequential circuit that can add two arbitrarily large numbers. And what it will do is it will take in on each clock tick a pair of numbers, one from A and one from B. For example, A0, B0, and then A1, B1, and then A2, B2, and so on. Okay, pause the video and see what you come up with. All right, so let's see how to do that. We'll create a new circuit. We'll call it sequential adder. And so we're going to take in a single bit per clock tick. So I'll have my inputs here, A and B. And also during each clock tick, we're just going to add a single bit. So I'll just grab a one bit adder here. And now the key observation is, what is the state of the sequential circuit? What do we have to remember from tick to tick? And so if you think about a ripple carry adder, what is the piece of information that's handed from full adder to full adder is the carry. So we just need to remember a single bit, the carry. So we'll send in inputs A and B. And then what we have to deal with from cycle to cycle is the carry. So the carry will come out from one cycle and need to be fed back in. Now, because we're taking in bits one cycle at a time, it'll produce the sum one bit at a time as well. Now, in order to make the output easier to see, rather than letting that output change as the adder produces the output, which will also have some transient values because the carry won't come out of the flip-flop immediately, I'm also going to add a flip-flop for the sum. That way we only ever see the, the sum when it's complete. And I'm also going to put a watch on the sum. That way we can see its value down here in the bottom when we run it, so we can see how it changes over time. Now what do we need in the clock? So we have 30 for this adder, 50 for the carry, so I'm just going to time the clock out at 100. Don't forget to connect the clock to both of your flip-flops. And now we need some input. So we'll set up a signal generator. And to save some time, I'm just going to paste it in from a value I've put together off screen. In particular, we're going to be adding 110110 to 010111. And if you notice here, if you can see that, we're going to be putting the bits in backwards. We're going to submit the least significant bits first because those are the first bits to be processed. Now you can see over here on the side that when we add this together, the output should be 100101. So I'm going to set my step to half a clock cycle. Now through that first clock cycle, we're going to ignore that output bit because that out register is simply returning its default value. It's not until the first clock tick that we can see the first update and we see that the sum is one for a clock period. And then the next clock period, it's a zero and then it's a one. But since at this point there's two ones in the output, so we see that it's a one for two clock periods and then a zero for two clock periods and then a one. And now at this point there's no more input, so the sum is just gonna sit at zero. But 
The key idea here is that we can add as large of integers as we care to. We just have to put the input in one bit per clock cycle and read the output one bit per clock cycle. All right, so at this point, you should be able to explain the difference between combinatorial and sequential circuits. And you should also be able to design reasonably simple sequential circuits. And if I give you the diagram of a sequential circuit, you should be able to trace that circuit and determine its behavior, and then describe that behavior using either a characteristic table or a timing diagram. In the next video, we'll look at finite state machines, which is a common way of describing many problems that can be easily implemented as sequential circuits.